once you're ready, then I can. Uh... All right, so we are live. Welcome to another episode of Roasting Marshmallows. My name is Rolf Suet, and today we are talking about rewards. Rewards such as the Nobel Peace Prize. Is it actually a, a bad thing, maybe? Uh, what about that cum laude degree that you might have on your wall? Did your grades ruin you for the rest of your life? Uh, awards motivate people. Uh, they motivate people to get rewards. You can pretty much bribe anyone to make them do what you want them to. Consequently, the quality of the work or the learning suffers for it. This goes for children, students, but also in the workplace, where reward structures might be in place that incentivize destructive behavior. The book, Punished by Rewards, details the trouble with gold stars, incentive plans, grades, praise, and other bribes. And we are roasting marshmallows with its author, Alfie Cohn. Alfie is an author and lecturer in the areas of education, parenting, and human behavior. He's a proponent of progressive education and has offered critiques of many traditional aspects of parenting, managing, and American society more generally, drawing in each case from social science research. Welcome, Alfie. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, of course, I'm joined today by uh, Enrique and Arno. Yeah. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, Arno, you wrote, you actually uh, read the book, right? So, uh, I read the big parts of it, yes. Yeah, I read nice. it as well fully. And well, I have we're to say, one for three anyway. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. No, but I did read it fully. And I have to admit that it changed my life. I don't know if it's for the better or for the worse, but I have a lot yeah. of questions for you today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and I find it a bit just... disturbing, actually. <laughs> And let me just uh, start by asking probably the most obvious question that you have probably had a million times before. Uh, but, uh, you know, my child needed to learn how to ride a bike without training wheels, and uh, he was not really motivated to do so. So I uh, offered him a Nintendo Switch in exchange, and he learned it within the first weekend. Did I ruin him for the rest of his life? Well, you're setting up a bit of a straw man here where oh. it's... <laughs> The, the answer is, I guess it was okay if you didn't have a catastrophic effect of that <laughs> magnitude. But the question I would have reframed as, yep. was there a more respectful and constructive way to help him learn to ride a bike rather than treating him like a pet? Yeah. And the answer to that question is probably yes. Yeah. We don't know how quickly he would have learned it without that. But we do know that in general, the more you reward people for doing something, the more they tend to lose interest in whatever they had to do to get the reward, to say yeah. nothing of how they now come to look upon the person who tried to bribe them to do what that person wanted, rather than being more responsive to what were the nature of his concerns and reservations. Right. Yeah, so okay. I think like uh, when, I, when I have, after I read your book, I tried to have this conversation with several people because somehow deep inside me, I knew like your research to be somehow true, at least resonated to me. I had this whole feeling about like, wow, that makes sense, you know? So I don't understand why we live in a world like we live today, basically where everything is about, well, as you say in your book, carrot and sticks. And can you elaborate a bit? Like, why do you think that is that why Everywhere we go, it doesn't matter if it's school, work, sports, events, everything is around this. Well, more broadly, everything or many things are yeah. around ways of doing things to people rather than working with people. And the two central modalities of doing things to people are bribes and threats, mm -hmm. rewards and punishments. And this is almost always the case with people who have more power trying to elicit their desired response from people with less power. I've been writing and speaking about this for a long time. And the more, the more I think about it and the more I read, the more I'm convinced that you cannot really analyze why people use rewards and what the effects are without understanding that it's predominantly about power. Um, it's about teachers trying to make students do whatever they want, regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's in the student's best interest. It's about parents doing the same for their children and managers doing that to employees. So if you try, if you have a focus only on the top level, only on the surface, only on behavior, yeah. without any concern about the experience of people and their motives and values and needs, and if you're focused mostly on the short run, not what's going to happen later on, both of those will lead you to just try to control people to work, to do things to them. And if you have any kind of conscience or self-awareness, you'll see 
how obnoxious it is yeah. to do that by threatening people. So you'll convince yourself that you can have the best of both worlds by bribing them instead. So here you've got a power dynamic focused only on behavior, only on the short run, but with people who try to make themselves feel better by saying, here's what you'll get if you obey me, rather than here's what I'll do to you if you don't. Mm. All of that converges on making these very popular, even though they're very counterproductive. It sounds very sad as well. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to do, you know. <laughs> because like, yeah, I, but, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, because it's so ingrained in our culture, right? To just, uh, yeah, reward. And we're, we were always taught as parents as well, like uh, to not punish our kids, but to reward them. And I think they're even talking, uh, or at least having like ideas for adults as well, to not uh, fine people anymore for, for example, speeding, but to award, uh, you know, good behavior on the road, for example. So it's 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 so so ingrained in our society. If it makes society. any difference, you know, it's. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just that's just control through seduction, but it's yeah. still control. Exactly. You know, we have, well, there's a saying in, in, in English, you may have heard it, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Yep. You know? Yeah. But yep. the real question is why we're catching them and how it feels to the fly. Yeah. You know, I, I, they, it's still all about control. It's just, it's just a different kind. You know, if you're going to work with people to help mm -hmm. them develop a commitment to a good value or action, that takes time. It takes yeah. effort, it takes talent, it takes care. And above all, it takes courage because you have to pause and ask, maybe is the problem here not with this person who won't do what I want, but rather with the appropriateness of what I want, you know? Mm -hmm. But it takes no time, no care, no talent, no effort, and above all, no courage to say, jump through my hoops and you'll get a doggy biscuit. Yep. So that's one reason why it's it's easier, it's expected, it asks less of us, um, and it keeps people in power, securely in power. Yep. Again, all of those can explain why something that doesn't work well uh, in the long run and by more ambitious criteria can persist forever. Like, but you are touching a, a point that... Uh, uh... I expect that if you tell this story to any educator, and I think Arno can speak because he's trying to change his teacher behavior, or if I tell the mother of my kid or the friend of mine who is a parent, the first reaction is like, what are you saying? Like, there is no way yeah. I can do this. It's like, they get so defensive. Like, do you experience this? You know, because I can imagine that the first reaction of people is like, yeah, this is not possible. Well, yes, there's a lot of defensiveness with, oh, that wouldn't work with my kids or yeah. in my classroom or, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds nice in theory, yeah. but by the way, when people say that, my experience is they don't even like the theory. Um, <laughs> but w w when people react this way, what they're basically saying is, la, 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 I can't hear this, it's too threatening. And one reason they might be reacting that way is because it does ask more of them in many ways yeah. to be more responsive to the people they're trying to control and less controlling. But it also may provoke that reaction for a different reason, I, I think, which is now you're asking me to ask hard questions about myself and the way I was raised and taught. And that can be terrifying, not just unsettling. Um, and I, I guess partly though, it depends on how it's presented. So I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways of being provocative about this without provoking people to the point that they shut down with varying degrees of success. Oh. But one way I often come about this is to begin by asking teachers or parents, what are your long-term goals for these kids? How would you like them to turn out long after they've, yeah. they've grown up? Hmm. And I go, I've gone all over the world and asked this question of parents and teachers uh, and administrators of young children, of older children in rural, suburban, or, or, you know, urban areas. And everywhere I go, I get the same kind of reactions when people are thinking about long-term goals. Well, I want my kids, either my own kids, if I'm a parent yeah. or my students, if I'm a teacher, to be happy, to be ethical people, to be caring and compassionate, but also to be independent and self-reliant, to be curious, critical thinkers, creative, successful human beings. 
Everybody says stuff yeah. like that. And so what I do for a oh. living is I say to people about different issues, you say you want this, so why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And I, then I present evidence to show that the very things they say they want, never mind what I want, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> those goals are, are actively impeded by the use of rewards or punishments. And I often begin by helping people see that rewards and punishments are not two different strategies. They're two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Getting kids to say, what do they want me to do? And what happens to me if I don't do it? Is, yeah. complete, is very similar to what do they want me to do and what do I get for doing it? Both of those are completely different from questions like, what kind of person do I want to be? What kind of classroom do we want to create? And, and they're actively discouraged from asking those latter questions when they're asking one of the first two. And then I present evidence. You said you want your kids to be caring, good, ethical people. Here's the research showing that children who are frequently rewarded or praised by their parents, praise after all is just a verbal doggy biscuit. Good yeah. job. <laughs> I like the way you, right? Pa kids who are rewarded or praised are less generous and caring than other kids. The research is very clear about this. And I help walk people along, even those who are resistant to figuring out why that might be true. Don't just take my word for it. You know, look up the studies, fine. Yeah. But even then, construct meaning around those. Well, I guess if the goal is to get a patronizing pat on the head or a sticker or a candy bar, then I become less concerned about the impact of my action on someone else and less likely to continue doing nice things for that person when there's no grown up around to catch me being good and giving me a doggy biscuit, positive reinforcement for it. Yeah. So I'm going to gradually become more self-centered the more you've praised me for caring. Yeah. Makes perfect sense once you look at it and the research confirms it. So now you have to choose. Did you mean it when you said that you wanted kids to be caring, compassionate people? Or are you so determined to keep treating kids that way that you're going to blow off the likely counterproductive effects? And what I've said for uh, generosity is true for all the other long-term goals. You want kids to think deeply, you know, yeah, yeah. as students and play with ideas? Well, here's the research showing that if they're trying to get a good mark, a good grade, they think in a more superficial way. Because now the goal is to get the high mark and they are going to cut corners to get there yeah. and do it more expeditiously and reliably. So you've just destroyed intellectual risk taking by giving them a 100 or a 6 or a 10 or an A or, yeah. or, or whatever. And if parents give kids a reward for getting a good report card, now you've multiplied the damage because you're giving them a reward for getting a reward. <laughs> you can almost watch their interest in learning evaporate before your eyes. Yeah, and yeah. I can definitely uh, uh, relate to that because that's exactly what, that's what happened to me in high school. And after I left high school, then I went to the work environment and suddenly my interest in learn somehow came back and took like really long uh, because yeah, somehow school damaged that. But there is one part that you say like, okay, punishment and rewards, they are kind of the same side of the coin. Uh, how do you say then is the right way to, let's say, praise right because sometimes i have a small kid he's three years old he does something and i just have the feeling from the inside that i want to praise him for well what he has done so how do i know that i'm not doing something actually harmful rather than something that is actually oh yeah i'm actually proud that he went to pee by himself today <laughs> right 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 well first of all you're acknowledging that it's your need to praise that's yeah. the issue we have to work on mm. yeah so the question is not how do I praise him by, and minimize the damage? It's how do I deal with my impulse to do something that might turn out not to be okay. very constructive? So I would do this in layers. The first layer is to say, at least if it's genuine and authentic on your part, the motive for doing it, rather than trying to reinforce a behavior, okay, we can tick that box. That's yeah. step one. Good. Mm. You know it's obnoxious and counterproductive if your explicit goal is to reinforce a behavior and make the kid do that again so he'll get the praise. That is purely about control and absolutely not in the child's interest. 
but we're not done. Now we're at the second layer where we have to look at how it's experienced by the kid. Even if your motives are pure and your conscience is clean, the praise, the verbal reward may still be experienced by the child as an effort to control, as something manipulative, and it may have two effects. One is to make him more dependent on you rather than independent and yeah. become a praise junkie. Did you like that, daddy? You know, was that yeah. good? Yeah. And the second effect it's, it may well have, even if you did it for the best of reasons, is um, to become less interested in and excited about whatever the task was that became now reframed in his head as a means to an end. Mm -hmm. The end being to get the pat on the head. So if I'm, I mean, I'm, I have two children. I went through this myself and I've also been a teacher, you know, and I've watched many, many other teachers with a range of different styles. And what I've noticed is it's almost never necessary to judge your child. And let's be clear, praise is not encouragement. It's not feedback. Feedback by definition is just information. Yeah. Praise is judgment. It's, yep. <clears throat> so the question then is what, if you have to say something, what can you say that's not good job? I like the way you dot, dot, dot. Well, one thing you can say is you can just say what you noticed. When my daughter made it up the stairs on her own steam for the first time at about a year and a half, she looked around and I said, you did it. I was encouraging her just by being there and noticing. I didn't have yeah. to say, you're such a good climber. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> that would be stealing her pleasure and her little accomplishment. you know. And the other thing you can do, I think, is to ask questions. Yeah. And I mean real questions where you don't know the answer and you want to find out. Like if a child uh, draws a picture, I might look at it and say, there are toes on those animals. You weren't drawing toes last week. How did you figure out how to do that? That pulls her into the drawing. Yeah. Whereas praise of any kind pulls her out of the oh, drawing, drawing and into yeah. my face. Yeah. So it's really not uh, about patronizing your kids, but like really just ha trying to have an actual meaningful conversation about the act that they just did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in part, right. In part. Yeah. So, okay. so basically then our, our, internally we had this conversation a few times when a colleague actually asked like, then is there a place for judgment in let's say in education? Because you say like a praise is some sort of judgment, but like, is there any point in time that praise actually, it is a good thing or punishment is actually a good thing or judgment can actually be a good thing on your point of view? Uh, praise, probably not. Punishment, definitely not. Um, judgment, yes, there are times, I think, in an education process where we, we, we are judging all the time, and mm. at some point it can become disingenuous to pretend we're not. But I think especially with younger children, we can clear a space where the point for them is purely the doing, the engagement in figuring stuff out without having to wonder, how good am I at mm -hmm. this? So even informational feedback should be minimized. Yeah. With older students, I think there may be more need for um, this kind of informational feedback. If they don't know yet what's a successful essay or a good way of setting up an experiment or solving a math problem, they may need some feedback about that. Yeah. But sometimes they can figure it out themselves. Sometimes they can get it from a fellow student. Sometimes they might need it from us. But why do they ever need us to do the good job when they, we can simply say, it's possible that we might have gotten the results from that scientific experiment a different way. Let's figure out together what might have worked better. What we do know is there's never a need to reduce a child's performance or a student's performance, including a university student, to a letter or number, because that's yeah. purely about rewards and punishments, yeah. which totally s swamp the, uh, the information. Because we, we say a lot about, for example, kids and students, but like, does the same apply for individual performance at work? Um, Yes, with a, with a couple of di differences. Uh, one is, first of all, people at work need to earn money. There's nothing comparable to that, like grades that kids have to get. 
Yeah. So the goal of a good manager is to decouple the compensation from any kind of reward setup. So you got to earn money, but you want people to come to work and you want them to be thinking about the work. <laughs> so yeah. that means you would never do something like pay for performance, bonuses, incentives, merit pay, and the like. The other thing is even with adults, well, another difference is I really deeply care more about kids having a, developing a love of learning, of really wanting to do that lifelong, to play with words and numbers and ideas. Yeah. And so I am really on my guard against anything that would kill that. With employees, yeah, I'd like them to like the work they're doing if possible, yeah. but I don't feel that same commitment to it. So I'm not quite as concerned. However, it turns out that loving what you do is connected to how well you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So even in the workplace, a really thoughtful manager will not, you know, do rewards and punishments because not only does it interfere with quality of life, but it also interferes with quality of performance as a result. And we know on the receiving end that it doesn't feel that good to be controlled, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But I think the part that I, I get a little bit confused sometimes is, let's say if we look from, for example, at work, right? And I want to give a feedback to a peer, let's say Rolf is doing good on the podcast. How do I know that I'm not giving him a compliment or is more like a positive feedback. How do I know that? What is the difference between, let's say, I look at my girlfriend and say, wow, we look pretty today. How is that not like a reward for how she dressed? Do you understand my question? Sometimes it's very confused to know the difference. Right. Um, well, first, one thing that matters is the relationship that you have with the other person. Um, it feel, it's, it's much more dangerous when adults who have more power do it with children especially their own children who are highly dependent on their parents' unconditional love. The less unconditionality becomes figures into it um, and the less dependent you are, then I believe it's somewhat less useful. I mean, even with Rolf, you did a good uh, podcast. First, mm -hmm. I think Rolf would find it a lot more useful to have some information about what you noticed in the podcast that affected you when what could, whether it's positive or negative, is just to be specific when he asks for it. Yeah. That's another key for everybody, regardless of, of age and, and relationship, is feedback, even the kind that is devoid of judgment, and I think most likely to be useful, is not likely to be useful if you've imposed it because you feel like offering it. Yeah. So that's a good thing to say to peers, to friends, to girlfriends and boyfriends, uh, to children and students is, how can I help, you know? And when somebody says, how do I look in this dress? Then they're more likely to wanna to hear what you have to say about that. Um, and, but if you do it in a way where it sounds patronizing, then it becomes counterproductive and then you're flummoxed because you don't understand why. Hey, I said something nice, what, what's the problem? Well, I mean, have you ever been like at a dinner party and you said, make a point, you're talking about politics and somebody else says, that's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. You know, what that's doing is bringing to the surface how even with adults, very often, the person giving the praise is putting himself in a one-up position of, I get to judge you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's the way it might feel to your girlfriend or to Rolf, and certainly even if they can't articulate it to children. So don't offer judgments. But what, what makes the, the distinguishing feature of a positive judgment is not so much that it's positive, which is what we want to believe, but that it's a judgment. And, you know, when people, there are people who, who light up when you say something nice about them, about their podcast, about their mm -hmm. dress about what they've learned or what they've done. And they're so dependent on that person in whom they vested the authority to judge them. Please give me more. And now I want you to say, compliment me again. That's when I worry. Yeah, That's yeah. when I worry. And by the way, that's exactly the kind of, of, of dependence on praise that you would expect to happen for someone who was raised that way. Exactly. That develops during childhood. 
Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't want my daughter and son, and I might add here, this is gendered to some extent in our societies, at least, especially my daughter, to grow up to be the kind of person who is dependent on her boyfriend or yeah. her boss to tell her she looks nice, she's funny, she's smart or whatever. And that's exactly the kind of dependence I'm likely to create by tossing out uh, verbal doggy biscuits. Yeah, and treating them like a, a princess and then expecting to be treated like one when, once they're adult, I guess, also plays in with that a little bit. Well, princess brings in a whole, a whole another <laughs> narrative having to do with passivity, you know, and uh, women. Are, anyway, well, that's another conversation. Yeah, different, different subject, yeah. Okay, and and w w in in the workplace where, um, well, you said that uh, you know um, incentivizing people, uh, you know, can can really create toxic behavior. Uh, we've seen that, of course, uh, with uh, the dot com. Well, I mean, uh, not the dot com bubble, but uh, definitely with like the banking crisis and all that stuff, with the bonuses and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, is that also comparable to like the classic psychological experiment with the rat in the box, where you know people might have a really nice job that pays a lot of money, but then at the end of the day, they're just a rat in a box doing something for the treat that they're being offered. And is there a way out of the box? Uh, yeah, it's what I hinted at before, which is pay people well, pay them fairly, and then do everything you can to take money off of their minds. So they're yeah, thinking about exactly. what they're doing. And um, that's, that's sort of like the, just the first step. And, 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 and just to be clear about this again, any kind of pay for performance or incentive plan violates the last of those uh, yeah, precepts yeah. by putting money very much into their minds. Yeah. But that's, that's necessary for helping people to love their work, but it's not sufficient. Um, first, the work has to be worth doing and experienced yeah. that way. If you're doing crappy stuff, um, then yeah, it's understandable. You're going to say, you better pay me well. And even then I'm not going to, be joyful during the day. Yeah. So then the question is, how do you address with people, not for them? Yeah. Yeah. How, how we can change the tasks and the, and the job assignments so that the job becomes sort of intriguing. We see the connection between what I do during the day and how that fits into the bigger picture and ideally is helping to make the world a slightly better place rather than just to make rich people richer. The other thing, and this goes for kids too, at home and at school, but certainly also in the workplace, mm -hmm. is what's necessary for helping people to take pleasure from what they do and find meaning in it is not just the absence of rewards and punishments. It is a chance to have some say about what they're doing. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll just end on this note since yeah. our half yeah. hour is coming to a close, is Especially when you think about children, kids learn how to make good decisions by making decisions, exactly. not by following directions. So yeah. one of the things that explains why rewards and punishments are so not just ineffective, but counterproductive is because they're experienced as controlling. So the ideal is not just to get back to the baseline, to the zero by not doing rewards and punishments and eliminating the control, but to start moving in a positive direction by affirmatively bringing people in on making decisions about what they're doing, which is why the best parents, the best teachers and the best managers are all distinguished by a tendency to talk less and ask more. Right. And okay. when we treat people like that's what it really means to be encouraging, not to say, yeah. good job, I like what you did, but to ask them, how do you think it would work for us to do this better? I really want to know. Let's do this in a way that's more respectful, more egalitarian, more democratic. That's not just nicer. It works better. All right. Well, with that advice, I think we can all take that to, to heart, uh, to our kids, to our coworkers, everything. Uh, Alfie, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your day to, uh, to talk uh, to us. Um, and I also want to thank the listener, of course, if you have any questions or suggestions, then uh, please uh, reach out on podcast at forcecouch.nl. Uh, Alfie, is there anything uh, where people can uh, reach out to you uh, or look at a website or... A website would be great. Uh, my name, Alfie Cohn, K-O-H-N dot O-R-G. All right, or we'll include that. That has my, my um, information about my books, uh, as well as all kinds of articles available for free. 
All right. Thanks again. And uh, well, see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows, with your host, Rolf Sird. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit 4scouts.nl and on Twitter at 4scouts. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time on ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows.